Namaste. Namaste. There is an alert, a warning, that your sermon and your souls are in the hands of an amateur, <laughs> paraprofessional, with no graduate degree in theology or divinity. But with a whole lot of love, especially for you guys. God bless the broken road that led me home to fuse you. What was my broken road about? It was about growth. It was about a continual tension, even as a child, between belief and disbelief. Between my experiences of love and spirit and family and even spirit at church. And a whole lot of theological dissonance, disbelief, unhappiness, running into rules that said, I, as a gay child, was bad. And my journey is and continues to be about coming home where the heart is and being home. A little bit about my childhood. I was um, baptized a Roman Catholic. I was raised as one by a rules-based mother and an evangelical father. I had nine years of religious education daily in school. I won four awards in Catholic scouting. I had seven years as a full-time altar server, and I had another three or four because any time there was fire involved or the bishop was showing up, they wanted me to help. <laughs> um, I sang in my choir, I was in youth group. I learned my faith. I knew it. And to the best of my ability, I did it. But there was always an underlying dissonance, an underlying tension or problem. In third grade, eight years old, we were doing little Bible stories for religious ed every once in a while, like once or twice a week we'd have enacting a story. And I remember being struck that God would save it, send an angel to stop Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. An angel just stopped the sword in his hand. But then why would God turn around and say, oh, here's my only son Jesus, and I've got to kill him to atone for your ugly sins. At eight years old I said, something is wrong there. <laughs> and then I got to college. And I found out that I was a little conservative and didn't realize it. The first service was a Sunday evening service, and it was rolling along. And I came to the part, the first part where you kneel. And everybody's standing, and I'm in an auditorium, and I knelt by myself in the service. And over the first few months, I liberalized quite a bit to a point where I joined the poker club. And, and I learned that um, God wants you to be happy. And what does that mean for you? And how do you heal the brokenness of you and around you? And throughout college, I started dealing with the fact that I was gay. I fought it from when I had hints at nine years old to when I was pretty sure at 14 years old. I fought it because it shouldn't be. But by my senior year of college, I um, went to confession as part of the Lenten season. And I was talking and I was getting awkward and I was getting clammy. And I was getting fearful. And father, finally, Father Kevin um, said, Chris, what, what's going on? Why? What, what's, what sin is so big? I've known you for four years. I said, I'm gay. And he said, so? What, what does that have to do with sin? What, it, you've been missing something we've been talking about. So that felt like, wow, I, 
the thing I came to my own conclusion of is the right conclusion. God loves me just as he created me. And so, at the same time, what does the church do but kick you in the head anyway? I started to think, well, okay, back to my third grade self where I thought, well, maybe God wants me to do something. Maybe I'm meant to be a priest. And so I started talking with one of the other Paulus priests, Father Steve, who was my friend. And this is where the kick comes in. He goes, well, now that they know what you are, they won't want you. Not who you are, not how you are, what you are. So here I had all these experiences where I felt the Spirit of God and I felt connected to the universe and then there's a rule, there's a dogma, there's something that makes you a what. I have to start moving here. Uh, though I hope you're having a good time. <laughs> Post-college, I found a group of Catholic gay folks called Dignity USA. And I just want to share one little snippet of, of a glorious couple years. We talked about the sign of the cross and the Trinity. And the priest there was like, if you don't get the Trinity, don't worry about it. Because it's really a way of how we experience God. He's not involved, she's not involved in all of that. And it goes um, how we would pray at that point. Um, in the name of our God who created us, who redeems us, and who continues to make us holy and special people. And I shared that with a spiritual director about four or five years ago at the Old Catholic Church of the USA. And she said, oh, that's kind of a Unitarian perspective. Mm. <laughs> uh, I, I want to mention the books that brought me here and brought me into myself as a Unitarian Universalist. But I want to tell you my arrival story first real quickly. Um, Jimmy and I moved to town last May and I informed him as we were packing and moving that We'd be too far away from our old parish, and I was having theological problems. And we were going to try the first Unitarian Universalist Society in Exeter. And he said, yes. <laughs> um, so we showed up the first Sunday, and I saw the building, which is, frankly, a little rotted people. Uh, <laughs> And who steps down the step to greet me but Skip Barry? And he said, you didn't tell me you were coming. And he said, we didn't know you were here. <laughs> why, why is that pertinent? For two years, Skip was the guardian ad litem for my children in foster care. So I knew he was a person who cared for the spirit, the body, society. And so I said, they may not have a building that's in repair, but I think their spirits are in good shape. <laughs> um, a few months later, we were having our goodbye visit with the biological mom for Alexis. And as the day unfolded, it got trickier and trickier because instead of a caseworker and an intern and all these people, it was turning out that we, would have to say the final goodbye to this woman in a park alone. And it's tough enough to grieve for someone that way, let alone to be the person responsible. So we're in this park in Portsmouth, and who wanders in but our Reverend Kendra and her little guy to play at their park, which we were in. Again, we didn't know where we were. And Jim and I were like, is that who we think it is? <laughs> we better go say hi. And so we went over and we said, hi, if it gets awkward or you see this woman wailing and gnashing her teeth and falling on the ground, there's a reason. And we gave her a quick little blurb. And she said, I'm here if you need me. 
simple in her gentle way. And that made a lot of difference that day. I told you my story of our first Christmas without Christ being born redeemer and conqueror of all evil in existence. <laughs> and and, and you, you, it is a little silly to look at a cardinal and think of your mom and know that God is saying, hey, you're home. It's all good. But that's my experience. And then I went to new to UU classes with some of the pals here in the, in the room. And we joined membership. So God blessed my broken road and brought me home to you. God blesses our road no matter how we experience the divine. So how did traveling my free and responsible faith journey become my Unitarian Universalist epiphany? In this story, books are the heroes. As part of Takusa, we went to a lecture on the future of marriage and author night at the Bangor Theological Seminary's outpost in Portland. And this woman, a Unitarian Universalist minister from the mid-coast of Maine, wrote this awesome book. And at the signing, I told her my story and how she really excited me about her theology and philosophy. To Jimmy and Christopher, as you begin your prayer life and family, blessings to all, Kate Braystrup. I read this book, one little chapter, a morning, like breakfast, feeding your soul. This woman says a lot of really awesome things that are healing and hopeful, that tie in awesomely to our um, work last fall on a gratitude practice. Um, and she's an chain universalist. She's kosher. Um, so, so please enjoy that book if you come across it. Um, the next one's a little more serious. It's called uh, Unitarian Universalism, A Narrative History. And I'll have to be honest, I almost didn't make it through the first half. <laughs> it's a history book. But it's an important, really not long version for about seven, eight hundred years. Um, executions were not just for Spanish monarchs, errant popes. Protestants killed Unitarians as well. Um, they were so invested in a dogma, they forgot the message. I do not believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I have not been able to believe in the resurrection until since I've truly experienced death of people I love. It's a physical, metaphysical rule in my book that when someone is dead, they are dead in this realm. I hope for a lot of things in the other realm. But there's no carnation instant magic life. There isn't in my book. And when I realized that people died for believing what I just whispered to myself while I was reading this that night, I said, Jesus Christ, I'm a Unitarian. It, it was and is a simple epiphany. And, and, and it is funny, and if you say it like, Jesus Christ, I'm a Unitarian, you get even more laughs. But, but there's a brotherly quality to it for me. I loved how Jesus lived his life. To me, he's the way, truth, and life because of how he lived not some magical story about how he died and came back. And this is where I get to you. Oh, last book. <laughs> um, I don't know why this book drew me off the Amazon page while I was ordering the other. Um, it's an introduction to leaders of Unitarian Universalist congregations on Universalism. Quick, quick read. But it was like an old coat. 
everything I believed about spirit in our life. I was like, oh, we are all good. You know, God loves us all. Oh, it felt really nice. So Jesus Christ, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> and your roots are showing. <laughs> the women in the community will not welcome that comment from other women in their life. Because it means something different. <laughs> but you, the first Unitarian Universalist Society of Exeter, your roots are showing. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so comfortable here. If Jesus equals love, does loving make you a Christian? Obviously no. Absent dogma, I can only pin us as Christ-like. I like to say about myself that I've been following more and worshiping less since I was born in 1964. Well, the Unitarian Universalist Association was born in 1961. So I'd like to get away with saying that the Unitarian Universalist Association has been following Jesus more and worshiping him less since 1961. Love is the creed of this church. And Jesus Christ, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. And I'm on this journey with you. Before I wrap up, I want to quickly tell you about a children's book character you may not know. We have children in our life, so we know Pete the Cat. Now, Pete the Cat is walking in his white shoes. And he steps in blueberries, they turn blue. He steps in strawberries, they turn red. He steps in mud, they turn brown. He steps in water, and they're white again, but they're squishy. And throughout this whole thing is the theme, no matter what you step in, <laughs> keep walking and keep singing your song, because it's all good. So let's get back to our reading today. We awaken in our time against the reading that I found for today. No author is cited, but it's from Xavier University's prayer book. There's hope for them yet. <laughs> I hope my sharing of my history and the tension in my belief journey and my UU epiphany awakens our journey anew. I hope that we travel together and that the great unfolding universe of many blessings awaits us. Blessings to use and to share, to further good and love. Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better. I see our growth as awakening, where we learn intellectual things, hard sciences, social sciences, and then we turn around and we make better realities real in our time, in our time in evolution ongoing. So before I close with the prayer, like Pete the Cat, if I've stepped in something today and it's unsettling to you or me or us, as us, may we keep walking together and may we keep singing our song because it's all good and we're standing on the side of love. Amen. Um, I'd like us to join together in prayer if we may. It's on the lower half of the reading from today in the flyer, in the uh, flyer in the order of order of service. <clears throat> and the way I read this, I just kind of stop on every line, at the end of every line, like it's a poem. And you're very invited to uh, say it with me, and you're also invited to say amen if you're so moved. Don't feel any of it's required. Together we pray. O oh, gracious, gentle spirit of love, your energy permeates the universe, igniting earth with your goodness, truth, and beauty. Open our minds and hearts to a deeper awareness of our interconnectedness with you, each other, and all creation. May we experience your unique presence 
within the sacred web of creation. Amen.